Welcome to Beg to Differ, the Bulwark's weekly roundtable discussion featuring civil conversation across the political spectrum from center left to center right. I'm Mona Charon, syndicated columnist and policy editor at the Bulwark. I'm joined by two of our regulars, Linda Chavez of the Niskanen Center and Bill Galston of the Brookings Institution and the Wall Street Journal. Damon Linker is off this week and sitting in for him is the Bulwark publisher, Sarah Longwell. And we are delighted to welcome as our special guest this week, Brink Lindsay, also of the Niskanen Center and not always on this continent. So welcome back to uh, North America, Brink. Um, All right. Um, Let us begin uh, with the war between Gaza, between Hamas and Israel and the dissension within the Democratic Party about how to handle this. Um, Hamas has, depending on how you count it and what time it is, fired some 4,000 rockets into Israeli cities and towns. Uh, Israel has responded with airstrikes. There's a humanitarian disaster unfolding in Hamas, uh, in uh, in Gaza rather. Um, there are two, 200 dead Palestinians, 12 dead Israelis. Um, So let me start with you, Linda. Uh, We've been through these before. Does anything strike you as different this time? Uh, Yes. Uh, Unfortunately, I think uh, Joe Biden um, is leaning a little bit uh, into his uh, progressive caucus and He at least gives every indication of starting to take a harder line uh, with Israel. Uh, Obviously, all of us would like to see the fighting stop. Uh, But uh, I think it's important to remember that it was Hamas that launched those 4,000 rockets into Israeli citizen uh, cities. Uh, And that uh, Israel has not only a right to defend itself, but has a right to try to protect itself from future attacks, which is why it is using overwhelming force to try to disrupt the network of tunnels that lead uh, from Gaza uh, into Israel that um, uh, have been uh, the source of, uh, you know, tremendous uh, attacks on Israel in the past. And I think that so long as you see some wavering in support um, in Congress uh, on the the Democratic side, uh, you're... uh, putting Israel in a very difficult position. I don't think that, uh, I'm I'm not a huge fan of of Bibi Netanyahu in in a lot of circumstances, but I don't think he really has a choice here uh, in terms of trying to deal a uh, really uh, overwhelming blow against Hamas, because it's not just these attacks on Israel. It's also Hamas is trying to get political control um, over the Palestinian people. It is trying to wrest whatever um, support uh, the Palestinian Authority has and uh, the various other groups. Um, It wants uh, preeminence and Uh, Of course, it's being aided uh, in addition by Iran. So uh, I I think we're in a very tough situation right now. And obviously, it would be great to have a ceasefire, but I don't think Israel is ready to to have a real ceasefire until they feel like their military uh, goals are met. Bill, um, the the trend in the Democratic and Republican parties has been evident for at least 15 years now, namely increasing support for Israel among Republicans, decreasing support among Democrats. Um, The Trump years turbocharged those trends. Um, So you saw, for example, um, that between um, 2016 and 2018, uh, support for Israel among Democrats really plummeted. And uh, only 27% of Democrats in 2018 said uh, that they were more sympathetic toward Israel than they were toward the Palestinians, whereas 79% of Republicans um, say that they are. Um, do you see, so, you know, we've heard from Rashida Tlaib, who is a, an Arab uh, American member of Congress, who's saying that uh Israel practices apartheid. Um, 
and uh, AOC has has voiced similar sentiments. Um, do you see a tendency in the left of the Democratic Party to um, equate to to see Israel through a domestic social justice or racial justice lens? Well, yes, and this <clears throat> this is nothing new. Uh, I would caution, however, against uh, explaining too much of what's going on with reference to the internal politics of the Democratic Party or the internal politics of the United States, for that matter. Uh, I think the conflict in the Middle East right now is being very much driven by its own imperatives. Uh, There are people on both sides who have an interest in in continuing the military military dimensions of this struggle. Uh, And I wish that the spectrum of discussion in the United States were as broad and nuanced as it is in Israel, uh, because the standard the standard analysis in Israel is that there are two winners of the conflict already, namely Netanyahu uh, and Hamas, and two losers, namely uh, you know President you know President Abbas of uh, the Palestinian Authority, who's now in the sixteenth year of his four month four year elected term, and the anti. Netanyahu coalition in Israel, which was about to declare the successful formation of a, of, of a coalition government to oust Netanyahu. Uh, and uh, I also wish that it were possible to decouple the question of the military struggle between Hamas and Israel from the broader question of the events leading up to this particular explosion of violence. Uh, And uh, I despair of being able to conduct a nuanced discussion of any of the, any of these questions, you know, under the, under the pressure of American political imperatives. So, um, Brink, uh, Bill mentioned that Netanyahu um, was, who is quite the political maneuverer and survivor, um, was unable to form a government. Um, this was the Israel's had four elections in a very short period of time. I think over just a couple of years, uh, he was not able to form a government this time, and he was about to have to hand it over, as Bill says, to the opposition, and then. Hamas hands him a huge favor. Um, and so now his popularity is rising again. Um, and, uh, and so, so there, there is that, but one of the, uh, one of the proposals that I saw in terms of going forward, look, there will be a ceasefire. These things are always, they, they always come to an end. Um, and uh, and then you know things go back to the way they were. You know the the international community gives support to Hamas to rebuild, which is necessary because they're you know they have terrible devastation. But then they use some of that to um, to stockpile more missiles, getting ready for the next round of violence. Um, and so one of the proposals that I saw it was from Eli Lake uh, was you know yeah give give Palestinians in Gaza reconstruction aid, but don't funnel it through Hamas this time. What do you think? Possible? Uh, So I think there are better and worse ideas of how the U.S. can respond to these things at the margins. But but I agree with the thrust of Bill's comment that uh, we have very limited uh, leverage over the situation. If if I could just sigh continuously for two or three minutes, that that I think would probably be my most eloquent contribution to this discussion. Mm. Um, it's, uh, I mean, there's, this is a quagmire that makes your typical quagmire look like a class five rapid. Um, sure. The, uh, the, you know, I, I long for uh, the possibility of a, of a two state solution. I think the occupation is bad for the Palestinians and it's bad for Israel. Uh, but alas, uh, 
Palestinians have made no moves whatsoever towards a kind of leadership that would make a two-state solution possible. The, the left has collapsed in Israel, so there's absolutely no political constituency for, uh, within Israel for anything other than hardlinism. So uh, I don't see the possibility of things moving in a good direction anytime soon. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I think the U.S. leverage over this is close to nil. Uh, Israel can, uh, has shown they can brazen it out and, and, uh, and, and live with a lot of international disapproval. Uh, and meanwhile, their long-term strategic position seems to be, to be stronger now than it was a decade or two ago. Uh, and then, uh, finally, uh, or, or next, uh, uh, however, this turns out one way or another, the, the larger implications uh, for the world are pretty small. Uh, this just isn't uh, uh, a Cold War frontline battlefield anymore. Uh, the importance of oil lurking in the background isn't the same as it used to be. Uh, the common enemy of Israel, uh, excuse me, of Iran has, uh, has brought uh, Arab states into uh, making peace with Israel. So the dynamics have all changed. Uh, I, I can see a this messy bad equilibrium being stable for quite some time. Uh, and so my my most realistic hope is that we, uh, the Biden administration doesn't get dragged into uh, uh, making claims for uh, things it can accomplish that are not capable of being accomplished. Yeah, that's, um, th th those are really good points. Um, you know, and apparently the Biden administration had hoped to uh, back burner this, this matter, um, uh, though obviously they, they can't control what happens on the ground, but they certainly weren't charging into office, you know, with huge promises of breakthroughs uh, in the region. They were, seemed to me a lot more realistic about that. But, um, but Sarah, I want to, I want to pick up a little bit on, on Brink's point about, um, the importance of this region, because we, I do think it's really interesting the 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 selectivity of of world attention and and our own press's attention to conflicts around the world. So, just a quick survey: um, there have been two thousand people killed in the last year in Ethiopia's Tigray province. We haven't heard a word about it, uh, or very little. Um, there have been 10,000 people, um, overwhelming majority, civilians killed in the fighting in eastern Ukraine um, over the last few years. There have been um, 11,000 civilians killed in Africa by Boko Haram. Uh, there were it, it, In Syria, uh, there have been 400,000 uh, killed. Now, this, of course, did get attention, but again, not the kind of minute, you know, casualty by casualty, blow by blow coverage that you get with Israel and Palestinians. Uh, so 400,000 killed in Syria, 5.6 million refugees, and on and on. Yemen, um, same story. So it is um, it is striking, isn't it, that that this conflict, um, and it is, this is not to say the conflict isn't terrible, and for the people involved, it is awful, but we do we do pay way disproportionate attention, don't we? Yeah, although I I don't know. I guess it sort of makes sense to me that we do, um, in part because just about every American president in my lifetime has kind of made it. They're going to be the ones to help solve this problem, and so we've become deeply invested in trying to solve the problem. And also, um, I think that we're we're closer culturally in a lot of ways. I mean, I know lots of people who've been to Israel. I've consumed lots of media uh, that uh, talks about uh, Israel and uh, and Palestine and this conflict in a way that I do not consume media that talks about um, lots of these other um, lots of these other conflicts. I will say. I just I don't understand why we have to talk about this because I was pretty sure that Donald Trump and Jared had solved this problem. <laughs> and so it just I I just I'm, I'm I was deeply certain that this had already been solved for us um and and I and joking aside I guess I understand Linda's criticism of Joe Biden um and the way that he's handling this uh but I guess there's also this part of me that is relieved that Joe Biden is the one in this position as opposed to either Donald Trump or a different Democrat, mm -hmm. um, because at least he has this decades-long relationship with Netanyahu um, and 
has a, a, a long-term sense of America's engagement with the conflict uh, and whether or not he is being pulled by his left flank, which I think is undoubtedly true. The politics around Israel have completely changed on the left, um, and he's got a ton of different uh, pressures than previous presidents. Um, but I am glad that it's him as opposed to potentially somebody else. Yes. Um, and, uh, Bernie, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I did, I did learn something today listening to the, uh, New York times, uh, daily podcast, uh, which I, I had, I had suspected, but hadn't heard confirmed before, but they, they seem to say that, you know, Biden was really not, a hundred percent, well, very much not on board with Obama's approach to Israel felt that, Obama, the Obama administration didn't take Israel's concerns uh, into account nearly often enough. But that much having been said, I think, uh, Sarah, I'll ask this of you. It seems to me that one of the things that Israel always had going for it vis-a-vis the United States was that um, support for Israel was a bipartisan matter. And uh, Netanyahu really strongly, first of all, he went hard against Obama and he, um, you know, lashed himself to Trump. And that tended to um, polarize um, domestic, uh, the, 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 you know, added to the polarization uh, in, in the United States is in Americans' views about Israel. Don't, do you agree or disagree? Well, I agree. And I, I can re- really um, agree with it mainly from my own perspective, which is, I was, you know, 20 years ago, young conservative, just reflexively very pro-Israel. Um, and it was kind of just an easy, comfortable uh, position for me to have. Everyone that I knew was pro-Israel, um, and I, I, and I would say that in the last five years, I've really recalibrated. I've, I've a just as a more uh, sort of grown-up political observer, I've just watched it more. And, and there's something about I don't know if other people feel this. There's, there's something for me about having gotten older and having kids um, that causes me to look at these issues slightly with a more um, actually, I heard the daily where they talked to a 22 year old Palestinian woman, um, and uh, it 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 breaks your heart listening to people talk about what it's like to live with your five siblings who are one of whom is four years old, and your parents, and how you all you know live through the shelling and the bombing, um, and it's just a, it, it can it's very humanized, um, and what's going on is tragic and heartbreaking, and you you do sort of wish that there could be you know be a way that that these groups could find that it wasn't just living in sort of perpetual um violence uh but but Trump and and his relationship with Netanyahu um caused me to feel very differently about Netanyahu as, as well as the fact that the look the under Netanyahu Israel has pushed further right and sort of pushed the boundaries of what they're doing um in ways that that make me less comfortable yep Okay. Bill Galston, you wanted to add something. Yeah. I just wanted, you know, from within the Jewish community, uh, I can tell you that the 12 Netanyahu years have been a disaster uh, for the relationship between the Democratic Party and Israel. Uh, Because people who are strongly pro-Israel are not strongly pro Netanyahu, and many people and many uh, are firmly opposed to him, and that has created cross pressures uh, that has muted a lot of voices, including I will admit mine. My breaking point came when Netanyahu, without clearing it with the White House or the Democratic leadership in Congress, accepted the invitation of Republican congressional leaders to address a joint session of Congress denouncing the policies of the sitting president of the United States. Uh, Netanyahu could not have chosen a better way to drive a wedge between Israel and the United States than that speech provided. Okay. Um, since we've since we've sounded that note, I will just say for the record, because I, I don't disagree with that, but but uh, I feel the need to add a, a little bit of a note of support for uh, the pro-Israel side of this argument by pointing out that some of the things that are being said on the left are really over the top. 
um, calling Israel an apartheid state is one of them. Um, Israeli Arabs, of course, uh, are full citizens. They vote. They have members in the Knesset. There are Arab Israelis who sit on the Supreme Court. Um, they are, the, you know, they have a certain special status. Christians and Muslims are not required to serve in the IDF, though many do volunteer, or some volunteer. Um, but, uh, but in any event, it is. Um, it, 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 it has been said that Israeli Arabs enjoy more rights than Arabs anywhere else on planet Earth. So that's just worth saying for the record without commenting on Mr. Netanyahu. Okay, let us move on to um, the uh, vote that happened yesterday regarding a January 6th commission. Um, Sarah, you were optimistic. You, you thought there were going to be more than a dozen Republicans who would vote for it. There were, um, how are you feeling about this? It is so rare that my optimism comes to fruition. Usually I'm just like (laughs) Charlie Brown with the football. Um, (sighs) but, but I did think that, um, you know, the last couple of weeks, where uh, there are, there are, of course, it is a small number of Republicans, but this idea of purging Liz Cheney has left a bitter taste in a bunch of of Congress uh, people's mouths, and um, and I think many of them are are frustrated with Kevin McCarthy and with the switch in leadership and being told to take a voice vote, uh, which is a very cowardly way to purge Cheney. And so I think some of it, I just I believed that there was going to be. Um, a dynamic of dissatisfaction from a decently high number. Um, and, you know, on over on the other Bulwark podcast, the the next level, JVL had kind of set the line at, at 28. Um, and he and Tim, uh, my colleagues, took the under on that. Uh, I took the over and uh, and I was I was actually not sure that I wouldn't come away from that, you know, chagrined once again and disappointed. But, um, you know, 35 or 34, I guess, ultimately, um, you know, if you if you look back at the first impeachment, you got zero Republicans in the House. Uh, the second, you got 10. And now for the commission, you got 34. So as far as if, if I'm going to try my best to be optimistic and look for a silver lining, that's at least trending in the right direction. Um, but my optimism flags when I see the reports coming out of the Senate. Um, I mean, I think that McCarthy is very concerned about what a commission is going to turn up about his members. And I think he has gone to McConnell and uh, and McConnell has conveyed it to other senators that there is no, no good that comes of this for them, um, that it will be politically bad for them in the midterms, that there's all kinds of you know things that might come out. And so I think that the Senate may very well shut it down. In fact, I thought when I was doing my own whip count that um, at least you'd get the seven senators who voted to impeach but looking today, right now, even Susan Collins is not um, saying that she's going to be for and it. And Richard so, Burr. And Burr um, and some of the other people that would normally be on the list. And so um, it's disappointing. Uh, I don't think it's completely dead yet, but I do think it's looking less likely. Uh, Brink Lindsay worth breaking the filibuster to uh, create this commission? Because they're not going to get 60. Well, it looks like it'd be tough to get 60, uh, 10 Republican votes, therefore 60 votes. Um, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the filibuster and it's, uh, the way it's been used in the past, uh, uh recent years. Um, so I wouldn't mind seeing it go, but I don't think it's going to go for this. Um, and, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure the, the stakes really are high enough to warrant, uh, going nuclear in that respect for this vote. Um, I, of course, I think there ought to be a commission. Of course, it's just lamentable and deplorable, uh, that, that we're excited that uh, that 34 Republicans in the House voted uh, the right way. Uh, it looks like uh, Senate Republicans will kill it. Um, but um, I'm I'm done playing football with Lucy. Um, so <laughs> uh, so we already know uh, that this is Trump's party. Uh, that the base uh, fully believes in the big lie and insists on its electeds uh, humoring them. Um, and that the electeds are going uh, beyond that uh, to uh, to make sure that uh, uh, the minor- minoritarian power grab that failed this time will be successful next time. Uh, so uh, the Republican Party is dead rotten. Uh, its base is in the throes of, of terrible anti-democratic, illiberal delusions. Um, and 
I think we should have a commission because it's the right thing to do. Uh, but I, I see very little potential that uh, that disclosures from this commission are going to produce some kind of road to Damascus conversion on the part of any significant chunk of the Republican electorate. Uh, I, I don't see them being persuaded. The only thing to do now is to beat them. Uh, it's just to beat them again and again and again. And for the Democrats to have the self-discipline uh, to stay popular enough to keep beating them. Uh, so um, the the commission should happen, uh, but uh, but even if it did, I don't think it's a game changer. So, uh, Bill, two things are going on. Well, a number of things are going on. But um, so the Republican line um, about this is we can't look back. We have to only look forward. We don't want to be, you know, be backward looking. Um, and the January 6th was no big deal. Um, so they say that on the one hand. And on the other hand, they say, but we have to compare it to um, if we're going to study that, then then we should have a commission to look into the uh violence in Portland over the summer and that sort of thing, which they do think was a big deal, uh, but they're comparing them. But uh, but in any case, this is part of a larger picture. They are denying the reality of what happened on January 6th and inventing, and, and inventing this, this lie and circulating the lie about the vote being stolen. So um, this week we heard from... Um, the uh, Republican Majority Board of Supervisors in um, in uh, Maricopa County. So let's hear uh, from one of their uh, spokespeople. Let's hear what he said. Maricopa County, we don't do what's easy. We do what's right. We've done that for the last six months. Four out of the five members of the Board of Supervisors are Republicans. We recognize, and I anticipate you're going to ask questions about this, that a large percentage of Republicans believe that the election was stolen in 2020 uh, and that, you know, Donald Trump actually won. I want to be clear that I uh, believe that Joe Biden won the election. All right. And the reason that I feel confident in saying that, particularly in Maricopa County, is that we overturned every stone and we have professionals, both with the early voting and the Election Day voting. They did everything right. We asked the difficult questions. All right. And we certified the election back in November. But now it's time to say enough is enough. It is time to push back on the big lie. We must do this. We must do this as a member of the Republican Party. We must do this as a member of the Board of Supervisors. We need to do this as a country. Otherwise, we are not going to be able to move forward and have an election in 2022 that we can all believe the results, whatever they may be. So, Bill, um, it, do it does seem to me that um, if if if, as we keep seeing, all of these local Republican auditors and others are now popping up to say they're going to, they're going to challenge and re re audit and and recount again and search for bamboo shreds and ballots and so forth, that um, that the stakes really could not be higher because the Republicans are telegraphing that they don't believe elections are legitimate anymore if they don't go their way. Well, uh, I wish I could say that this was something new, uh, but in fact, that's exactly what Donald Trump was asked a week or so before the election of 2016, if you'll recall. I do. Uh, and, uh, you know, and so uh, you have a combination of a demagogue and a bunch of people eager to be demagogues coming together to produce a genuine threat to the continuation of constitutional democracy in the United States. I have nothing to add to the eloquent statement that you just heard uh, from a member of the board in Maricopa County. Uh, he spoke the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And the only question now is what are the options available to people like us who want a uh, democracy that enjoys the trust of the American people to be perpetuated for our children and grandchildren. 
I wish I had some glib answer to that question. Like a lot of people, I'll bet, who are listening to this, I'm engaged in a lot of discussions, a lot of cooperative activities with with people who are doing their level best to figure out what to do and then to do it with all of the energy and determination they have. Uh, I study these things for a living and I am at a loss as to what to do if an overwhelming majority of one of the two polit major political parties in, in the United States is determined to insist on its own view of reality. Uh, and so why, I guess like Brink in response to the first question, I wish I could just moan for two or three minutes. I mean, I, I really, you know, you know I, I don't often say this, but I am, uh, I haven't given up hope, but I am at my wit's end as to what people who believe the truth about the 2020 election can say to people who don't. If anybody else you know, has a more hopeful response, I hope to hear it in the next couple of minutes. <laughs> well, Linda, I'm turning to you um, for, for the hope here. Um, look, I, I don't, I, I think the significance of this commission is nothing that the commission will find. I mean, the, the commission could find beyond a shadow of a doubt that that uh, Trump orchestrated the whole thing, that Lauren Bulbert was carrying an M sixteen, you know, and uh, and guiding people. They could find any number of things, and and we know how the Republican base would take that. They would right. They would say it's 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 all fiction. So I don't think that what the commission would find is so significant. I think that what's significant is that eighty three percent of the Republican members of Congress of the House. Uh, voted against even forming a commission, which tells yeah. you where they are. It it does, and I you know I I can't sound an optimistic note uh, here about any hope of getting a congressional commission put together that is going to do an autopsy of what happened on January six. I don't think that's going to happen. I think any report that was done, no matter how meticulous, no matter how careful, no matter how fair. Uh, would in fact be interpreted uh, by the various parties in in totally different ways. But let me let me throw something um, out here, and I don't know that this is possible either, and it may be off the wall. But you know, I look back. Um, being old has some advantages, and having lived through uh, history, um, I was around during uh, the riots in the 1960s, and I look back on the Kerner Commission report. Um, and that, of course, was a commission that was not put together by Congress. It was established by Lyndon Johnson, and it was to study the cause of urban writing uh, in the 1960s. We have something very uh, different taking place today, uh, but uh, something that is very much tearing uh, apart the nation and polarizing the nation. And that is the radicalization that's taking place on the right, the uh, disaffection from truth, the um, the way in which uh, the right has been galvanized uh, into a kind of, you know, cult uh, group uh, that follows Donald Trump, whatever path they, uh, he wants to lead them down. But we also have radicalization taking place on uh, the left. And I don't dismiss uh, that the riots in Portland and other cities were horrendous and were very harmful. And if you happen to live in those communities, um, they did great damage. So I don't know if um, the president, uh, President Biden, um, could do this or would want to do this, but but forming a commission of absolutely stellar individuals um, that were not identified as partisans in any way, intellectuals and others uh, that do cut across the space to look at uh, trying to under uh, understand what is happening in the polarization 
and radicalization that is taking place uh, in America today, I think would be useful. Now, it wouldn't, you know, I, I, I don't want to sound like I'm, you know, giving in to the people on the right who say, let's have a commission, but let's study Antifa too. That's not really what I'm talking about. I'm not trying to make a kind of moral equivalency here, because I think the uh, attack on the Capitol, because it was literally an attack on democratic institutions, was fundamentally different uh, than the kinds of attacks that took place in cities where police stations were burned, etc. But I am more interested in the underlying phenomena of what is happening to the American people, where you now have large portions of certainly the Republican Party and the Republican base who have become radicalized. Um, And I think you have a growing radical movement on the left as well. And trying to get a better understanding of that, somebody needs to take a look at this um, in a careful way, in a way that is not simply aimed at coming up with, um, you know, good talking points for the various political parties in, in their agendas. And I don't know if Biden is willing to do something like that or if, or if it's even possible to do, but I, for one, would like to see some serious study of the phenomena that's taking place Well, thank you for that. Um, And it actually um, segues perfectly into our third topic today, which is Brink's excellent article that uh, appeared um, on the Niskanen uh, site called Moderation in Pursuit of Social Justice is an Indispensable Virtue. So... This brink was a play on the old Goldwater line, which... Uh, yes, moderation he, he, in pursuit of justice is no virtue. Uh, or, or, yeah, right, right, moderate, right. And uh, and what was the second half of it? I don't no, um, Yeah, ex- and, extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice, moderation in pursuit of justice is no virtue. There you go. Okay. So um, so you've modified this quite a bit. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I turned it on its head. Yes. You did. So um, so let's let's talk about this because um, because you are you're arguing for the importance of of putting aside one's vanity and um, trying to score points and saying, look, you know, let's, let's try to do things that actually work. Well, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Tell us what, tell us your, your thesis. Yeah. Well, here again, we have uh, 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 an issue, a thorny vexed uh, issue that, that, you know, dates all the way back to before the formation of our Republic as a, as a blight on, uh, on America, uh, the issue of, slavery and mistreatment of African-Americans uh, post-slavery. Uh, um, and right now, we've, uh, we've got a very polarized debate. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the, uh, the vast majority of Republicans now think whites are more discriminated against, against than blacks and just uh, uh, view any sympathy for the uh, goals of the Black Lives Matter protests as, as sort of sympathy with, with anti-American radicalism. Um, and uh, on the other hand, uh, you have uh, um, <clears throat> far left social justice uh, activism uh, that has cowed uh, uh, more centrist liberals uh, into uh, sort of going along with what the most extreme people on the left saying uh, for fear of being stigmatized as, as, you know, part of the white supremacy problem. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> polarization thrives on false dilemmas. This is a false dilemma. There's a, there's a big fat center ground, uh, which is correct, uh, which is uh, that uh, the legacy of uh, two and a half centuries of slavery and a century of Jim Crow is still with us. Um, that, uh, that there are just by inertia uh, and by uh, policies that were built during the openly racist era uh, remaining in place. Uh, you have uh, African Americans uh, in many ways uh, uh, subject to structural disadvantages uh, that keep them down uh, and that inhibit their uh, mobility and, and integration into the mainstream of American society. Um, at uh, so that's 
that phenomenon, that inertia of, uh, of structural black disadvantage is what the uh, social justice activists call systemic racism. Uh, so I think the phenomenon uh, is real. Um, but I think the, uh, the name and the framing are terribly unfortunate and self-indulgent and counterproductive. So we've, we've had a great cultural victory in recent decades of, of completely stigmatizing and marginalizing open bigotry and uh, intolerance, uh, which, uh, which uh, you know, used to just be endemic in mm -hmm. American life. Um, uh, but, but then once having accomplished that, then we take the terms for bigotry and intolerance, racism, white supremacy, and redefine them uh, so that they now apply to American society as a whole. Um, I think that rhetorical switcheroo is just uh, doomed to be inflaming uh, and produce defensive reactions on the part of, of uh, many white folks. Uh, so, and, uh, and yet it allows uh, the people who deploy that rhetoric uh, the thrill of righteous indignation and standing on top of the moral high ground and denouncing everything as, as of a piece with racism. Uh, then meanwhile, you have this kind of rhetorical whipsaw that the, that the truth behind the systemic racism analysis is that you don't need bigotry and intolerance to sustain black disadvantage. Inertia will do it for you. Um, but, but then, um, then you I use think that's the, a, I think that's a key point. Can I yeah. just you get a Sharpie and underline that, you know, because, yeah, because that, that gets missed all the time, that, uh, that the, the legacy of slavery and discrimination is enough to account for the differences that we see in life outcomes between American blacks and American whites without saying that there is a continuing uh, racist or white supremacist structure pressing down on them. Yeah, I mean, I think there still is. Uh, racism and discrimination in American life. I think right, there's pretty, pretty, too, you know, pretty, not, well not, pretty well yeah. documented ongoing discrimination in housing and job markets, but but it but it pales in comparison to to the weight of the past in in uh, accounting for the current disparities between black and white uh, standards of living. Um, right. So so uh, but uh, but you know we have this truth that inertia is enough, but then. They try to market that truth by using the terms for, for bigotry and tolerance uh, and intolerance to, to describe it, which is perverse. And then at the very same time that we're supposed to be focusing on structures, we've had this sort of explosion of a, of a kind of ro tent revival atmosphere across the country uh, of seeking out and rooting out individual acts of bigotry and intolerance and condemning them and, and putting pressure on whites and, uh, you know, everywhere from K through 12 uh, classrooms to uh, to uh, diversity and inclusion trainings at uh, in corporate America for uh, whites to sort of confess their sins and and confess their individual blameworthiness. So uh, you have uh, I think this sort of deep incoherence in the kind of state of anti racism today, where you've got this I think correct push to look at the structures that are maintaining uh, inequitable disparities in American life. Uh, but you're doing it in a way that's that's just seems calculated to make people push back against it. And then at the same time, you have this huge uh, sort of uh, explosion of of focus on on uh, kind of uh, looking into people's individual hearts and minds and passing judgment on. And your point is that um, it isn't really worthwhile to sort of try to police what people think and feel, as much as it is good to focus on policies that are going to improve the lives of everyone, including black people. Yeah. So uh, when it when it comes to the, the sort of relationship between culture and structure, uh, when it comes to poverty, progressives are, are quite clear uh, that, that they, they, they hate discussions of culture of poverty and think they put the cart before the horse, that, uh, that a lot of what we look at is the culture of poverty of family breakdown and high crime rates and drug use and low attachment to the job market, they say are largely consequences of these structures and of these disparities. And if you, if you improved black lives, uh, then the culture would take care of itself. Uh, but, but then uh, when it comes to anti-racism activism, there's this incredible focus on hearts and minds and, and, and purifying, uh, you know, uh, getting whites to face up to the, the deep ugliness that's in their hearts. Um, 
So, uh, you know, I, I, those, those don't go together. Okay. Um, really, really interesting piece. Um, who wants to jump in? Linda? Yeah, I would like to jump in. First of all, it was a very interesting piece, and I thought you dealt with a very difficult situation, uh, a very difficult topic, rather, in a very nuanced way. Um, one of the things that I think was most important about your piece, and I think that it is something that conservatives in particular um, fail to recognize, is the role that housing discrimination and the continued prevalence of uh, not segregation, law, uh, you know, legal segregation in the housing market, but nonetheless, the uh, the way in which communities still um, are divided in in many parts of the the country by race um, is very important because housing, uh, where you live, uh, determines where you go to school by and in, in large, particularly. If you're not a person of means and cannot afford private school for your children, uh, it obviously affects your um, your sense of safety. If you live in a high crime neighborhood, um, you know you're going to have a very uh, different experience than if you live in a safe neighborhood. Uh, it affects your accumulation of wealth. Uh, most Americans, the primary uh, source of of their wealth is their home ownership and the equity that they're able to uh, put together in that home ownership. So I thought that was very interesting uh, and important. But I also thought that, you know, your emphasis on talking about the way in which discussions of systemic racism, the discussion of, you know, the efforts to make all whites feel that they are somehow privileged by their skin color, um, I think this is something the left just doesn't understand is not only, I think it's wrong, number one, but it is so enormously counterproductive. Uh, The number of people who are willing to self-flagellate and to, you know, take on themselves individual responsibility for the history of like a legacy of slavery, for example, I think is small. Uh, And it is particularly small in communities made up of people whose ancestors weren't even here, uh, much less, you know, were part of, you know, the slave owning population uh, in the the 19th century and and prior. So I thought that was, um, I thought it was a terrific piece. And the part about the role that housing plays, I thought was uh, particularly insightful. Yeah, I didn't, uh, I didn't have, I didn't put this in the piece, but, but certainly, shaping the way I was thinking about this is my own experience in an, in an ideological movement in the libertarian movement uh, and where I was never really on the radical fringe, but uh, that radical fringe always uh, um, vexed me. Uh, and it vexed me that there were a whole host of ideas that, uh, that the libertarian movement was putting forward that had mainstream appeal. And yet people, in these, the, the sort of the radicals insisted on framing them uh, in this, uh, deeply unpopular uh, critique of sort of government, uh, any government at all, uh, a kind of anarchistic uh, critique of that all government is illegitimate. Um, and, uh, and you know, this, there's, a, there's a thrill of radical critique. There's a thrill of being lonely at the top of an unassailable moral high ground. And for libertarians, it's being able to proclaim everybody else is a statist. And you're the only person who really takes human freedom seriously. Um, and it's exciting to, you know, to win the ideological purity contest, uh, and, and be the, the, you know, the biggest L libertarian in your group. Uh, but that, uh, that doesn't, uh, that doesn't change the world. It's just purely performative self-indulgence. And I'm afraid a lot of that is going on on the social justice left too. On the housing issue, just in the last five or 10 years, we've had this huge sea change where finally, uh, uh, there is a broader recognition of the perversities of the way we regulate land use. Uh, and it's, it's has terrible outcomes on a whole host of fronts. It's makes housing unaffordable all over the place. Uh, it stymies economic growth by, uh, by preventing our most dynamic regions from growing. Uh, it worsens climate change by encouraging sprawl and it, uh, it, uh, locks in re- residential segregation and prevents uh, the kind of mobility that would that would allow uh, a closing of, of black white gaps 
Um, so uh, right now, when there is a chance for a really broad based coalition to push uh, what I think is probably the single most important policy lever uh, to help uh, uh, to help improve uh, black lives on the ground. Um, there is a, a, a yearning to uh, to uh, divert that issue into making it all about racial justice, which will uh, narrow the constituency for change and therefore doom efforts. To, to I don't think you should ignore race. I think that's one argument uh, to 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 uh, to, uh, to throw into the mix. But the the idea should be to build the broadest possible coalitions for changes that will actually help people on the ground rather than to score ideological points. And I'm afraid the latter is more important to ideologues. Bill Galston, do you agree with Brink that it's the best uh, public policy lever that we have available, changing our housing policies? Uh, it's certainly one of them. And it's, it's one of the prime examples uh, of of pretty much overt policies uh, leading, you know, preparing the ground for the kinds of residential patterns that we have now. And I'm not focusing so much on current zoning practices as I am on the policies of the FHA after the Second World War, which largely created, magnified, problems of residential seg segregation because African-Americans were largely dealt out of the huge surge in home ownership and wealth creation uh, that occurred after the Second World War with the active assistance of government and particularly the federal, the, the FHA. So I think that's, you know, that is a case where it's not simply inertia that produced current patterns that are unacceptable. It was active government policy. Uh, and if I could name one area <clears throat> where a measure of explicit reparation might make sense, it would probably be housing. Having said that, uh, I think we have to pay attention to the problem as it's presenting itself right now. Uh, which is a problem not just of economic opportunity, but of policing and the rule of law. I think it's a very good example of the wisdom of the general approach uh, that Brink is recommending, because conservatives say defend the police and progressives say defund the police. Neither is the answer. Each exacerbates the problem. Uh, there are significant problems that need to be dealt with, dealt with boldly but practically. Uh, and I am hopeful that the current negotiations led on the Senate side by Tim Scott on, and on the, Demo on, on the House side by Karen Bass, with a lot of senators and representatives who, who are in the disappearing but not yet vanished center participating behind the scenes. There's an example where we have a chance of getting past the rhetoric and actually doing something that will make people's lives better. Sarah, um, I had occasion to be discussing this not too long ago with somebody who identifies as a leftist. And I, you know, mentioned that, um, you know, if you talk to people in the African-American community, in the Hispanic community, they, they are not for defunding the police. Um, they want policing. Their their neighborhoods are not safe, and um, in some cases. And so, you know, it's uh, it's really a case where people on the left, in this instance, I would argue, and tell me what you think, um, they mistake their um, their preference for what's best for minority communities, and those are not always the same thing. Yeah. And well, it's, it, it's like this on so many subjects. And the thing that really that I loved about Brink's piece is this conversation around um, the collapse of the center, but also this passage, you know, I think there's value in setting forth reasons why strong disagreement with one poll of the debate doesn't mean you have to wind up at the other poll. Polarization yep. on racial issues as well as more generally thrives on false dilemmas. I mean, I, I think about this in terms of just you can think about it in so many issues, like the, the issue of immigration. The, it is not a conversation about 
open borders and building a wall. Like that is not where the vast majority of Americans live and exist in the way that they're thinking about politics. Um, they are much more moderate. And I think that, that um, you know, there are, there are opportunities for us to figure out how to rebuild that center. And I was interested actually in whether Brink had any um, thoughts on that, uh, because I think it's something I think about a lot, knowing that that most of the loudest voices on either side do not represent the bulk of where people are. Um, how do we get our politics to be m- more reflective of where people are? Just, uh, I'll, I'll take this occasion to make a, a quick uh, Niskanen Center plug. We've just launched a new uh, project on criminal uh, justice reform uh, headed by Greg Newburn, who formerly was uh, the head of Families Against Mandatory Minimums. Uh, and uh, we are very much uh, trying to look past this false dilemma of of critically de- uh, uncritically defend the police or defund them uh, that uh, that we see uh, uh, you know our goal is less crime and less punishment um, that we can't simply focus on uh, on mass incarceration as a civil libertarian issue especially when murder rates are spiking. Um, without paying attention to uh, to what happens on the crime control side, so uh, we think there is a, uh, a a strong body of evidence uh, that what we do now is uh, we don't catch many criminals, uh, and when we do, we give them draconian sentences. Uh, what we need to do is move to a different system where we do we're a lot better at catching criminals, uh, and we give them uh, shorter, more moderate, more certain uh, sentences. So quicker, more certain. Uh, less draconian uh, uh, punishment is more effective punishment. Uh, that and sounds so, good. So we could we there there is a better equilibrium out there where we have uh, uh, less crime uh, and uh, and we can also uh, start to dismantle the ma- mass incarceration that we built up over recent decades. And that's that's where we're trying to go. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you, Brink, for for writing this really thoughtful and, uh, and and insightful piece, and for sharing your thoughts with us. We'll now turn to our final segment, which is our highlight and low light of the or low light of the week, or you could do both if you wanted. Bill Galston, we will start with you this week. Well, thank you, Mona. Uh, my highlight, and it really is a highlight, will take us back to our first topic. You know the travails of the Middle East. Uh, I have long been associated with a a research center in Jerusalem called the Hartman Institute. Uh, And in the midst of this war, its leader, uh, Daniil Hartman, uh, son of the founder, David David Hartman, uh, I think has really distinguished himself as a moral and political voice in in the discussion inside Israel and within the Jewish community. Uh, He has written a series of very nuanced pieces from his position as a lifelong and unrepentant Zionist, uh, the latest of which is called Why Israel Lost the War. He's not talking about the 1973 war. He's talking about the current one. Uh, You can find it by going on the Hartman Institute uh, website, and I commend it to everybody's attention. Okay, thank you. Sarah Longwell. Well, I'll go back to our uh, second topic um, as a a highlight. You know, there's a a little-known congressman, or I don't know how well-known he is, but John Katko has been a a sort of moderate, pragmatic Republican who's in a purple district. And he's the guy who negotiated uh, the terms of the commission. And um, if anybody has the chance, they should go watch him. Uh, The speech that he gave when he was talking about why the commission needed to be formed, one of the things he does in it is systematically dismantle so many of the bad faith reasons that Republicans are putting forward about why the commission shouldn't happen. There's a lot of them who are who are telling lies about, you know, oh, well, this is how it would just give Democrats control, partisan control of the investigation. And, um, you know, in this environment where you're basically being purged from the Republican Party. And Kevin McCarthy actually went out of his way to throw CatCo under the bus um, after sending him to negotiate uh, for this commission. I just think 
uh, Katko has has comp- and he's also one of the ten who voted for impeachment, um, and he has just been sort of a relentless uh, voice for sanity in the Republican Party, and uh, sort of stood up, uh, I think, in this moment in a way where. I, you know, I often say maybe trying to will it to be true that courage can be contagious. Um, and cowardice is too. And I think, you know, cowardice has been running like a virus through the Republican Party. But to when I see somebody display that kind of courage, um, and then obviously to get 34 members of the Republican Party, which of course no one should throw a pizza party about, it's still 170 of them voted against it. Um, but it was something, and I appreciated what he did. Thank you for that. I, I would just, I cannot help adding, since we were discussing the polarization of Democrats and Republicans on the subject of the police, I can't help noting that um, Republicans are very pro-police, except on January 6th. Um, all right. Uh, let us turn now to Brink Lindsay. Uh, I'm going to uh, I'm gonna plug a book uh, that came out this month on what I consider to be the number one public policy issue on planet Earth right now, the pandemic. Um, in America, we're all getting vaccinated and the light, we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but I'm afraid that, uh, the coronavirus is going to kill more people in 2021, uh, than it did in 2020, uh, around the world. Um, and, uh, and very well, possibly into the next year as well. Meanwhile, uh, this isn't the last pandemic we're going to face. So we really, really, really need to understand uh, what went wrong and how we can do better, uh, going forward and next time. Uh, and one of the most riveting and maddening uh, things I've read about the pandemic is this book that came out this month by Michael Lewis uh, called The Premonition. Um, uh, it's uh, one of the blurbs on the back is, uh, I would read an 800 page history of the stapler if Michael Lewis wrote it. Um, and, <laughs> and, and that is exactly right. He writes brilliantly. And, uh, um, but he, he, the, the, the thrust of the story is that uh, is all about the failure of America's pandemic response uh, and in which Trump uh, plays virtually no role uh, in the narrative. Uh, the rot, the institutional dysfunctions go way back uh, deeper than that. Uh, and he tells the story of the or creation of the of America's uh, first pandemic response policy uh, under the George W. Bush administration and then how uh, lots of that got used in East Asia, uh, but not in America, and why that happened. Um, uh, and his uh, bad guy uh, is the CDC, uh, uh, and to a lesser extent, the FDA. But you can see uh, institutional dysfunction and, uh, and sort of a, a lack of uh, uh, critically needed state capacity is a longstanding problem that predated Trump. Uh, and um, so we've got... Uh, We've got big work to do uh, to uh, to up our game going forward. And, and he offers a, a wonderful guide to, uh, to what went wrong and how to do better. Thank you. I will uh, look forward to looking at that. Uh, I'm a Michael Lewis fan and also have over the course of the past year not been impressed with the CDC. So I'm primed for this book. Um Okay, uh, Linda Chavez. Well, um, I have taken a lot of heat for uh, having supported President Biden's nomination to be Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, Kristen Clark, uh, from some of my conservative uh, allies. So uh, I'm going to do an about face on a different civil rights nominee and point to what I consider a low light uh, from the Biden administration. And that is the announcement that President Biden intends to nominate Catherine Lahman or layman uh, for the Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights at the Department of Education. I think this is a bad decision and sends all the wrong signals. Um, she was previously uh, in that same position in the Obama administration, and she was the uh, responsible for uh, issuing guidance to universities uh, on enforcing Title IX, no. specifically in the treatment of sexual assault and harassment in colleges. So oh. as we know, uh, the Biden administration is probably going to pull back the regulations, which um, were, uh, I thought, pretty good. 
uh, that the Trump administration uh, issued under uh, Betsy DeVos uh, that, in fact, did give more due process uh, to those individuals charged with um, sexual assault or harassment in colleges. And so this appointment, I think, is sending all the wrong signals, and I'm very disappointed. Couldn't agree more. Um, not that we're for college sexual assault, no. mind you. <laughs> no, <laughs> but uh, no, really, the um, the the those that that guidance was terrible, and it and it really sacrificed due process. And uh, yeah, I'm with you, Linda. All right, um, mine. I'm going to take a page out of the uh, Damon Linker book and recommend uh, somebody on Substack, namely Noah Smith, whose um, whose Substack has the cute title of No Opinion. Um, and uh, he writes a lot about economics. And his one of his posts this week that I'm recommending was uh, called When to Start Worrying About Inflation. And um, he gives a, a really very smart and learned sort of quick uh, lesson about uh, inflation and about what causes it and about how who's responsible for um for keeping it in check. And, um, I recommend it, but I, but just to, to give you a little pricey, he says, if inflation stays above 2% for six months, you should begin to worry. And he also says, when politicians begin to talk about price controls, look out. Uh, that's always a bad sign. Um, okay. Thanks to uh, Brink Lindsay uh, as, uh, for being our guest this week. Thanks to Sarah Longwell for sitting in. Thanks to our listeners. And we will be back next week as every week. 